So I'm super excited to be with you guys today. Personally, this is a really important topic. I think there's probably no one who hasn't dealt with anxiety or depression themselves. And if you haven't yourself, you've got somebody in your life that has. And so I just, I love that we're actually talking about it. One of the things that Linda was saying earlier when we were just talking was how important it is just to talk. So I love that you guys are here and that we've got our great panelists with us today. So I want to remind everybody that we'll have time at the end for questions and answers, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Go ahead and enjoy your lunch. We're not bothered by that. You know, we all know that you're busy and got to get back to work. So we appreciate you being here with us. We're also streaming live, the cameras are in the back, on Facebook, uh, on Facebook Live for both the museum and the Women's Fund pages. So if you want to share it with someone later, you know, you can just share that link and let them watch it with you. The uh, Women's Fund is going to post that recording uh, later today for you so you can share it. So with us today, we've got Angela Carruth and Teresa Doyle and Mary Beth Di Diacono. Yay, I got it. And each panelist is going to just tell us a little bit about themselves, what they do, and kind of how it relates to what we're going to talk about today. Angela, you want to go first? Sure. Is this on? Yeah. Um, Angela Korath. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Um, I actually supervise also interns that are getting their licensure. Um, I work for the Medinger Clinic. I am the program manager at their outpatient location in Bel Air. Um, we see lots of individuals from kiddos to older adults. Um, from marital problems, um, just having issues with transitions in life, substance abuse, mental health issues. Um, there's a team of eight of us, um, from interns all the way to PhDs, and we actually have a med provider at our location. Um, we're an extension of the Meniger Hospital that's located off of uh, Maine. Hi, my name is Teresa Doyle. I have my master's in psychology with a specialty in marriage and family therapy. I'm a licensed professional counselor, a licensed marriage family therapist, and a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Um, I have a private practice that I've been working in for about 35 years. So I think I'm the old one up here um, and real proud of it. Um, and uh, for the last 18 years, I've been working at a place called Angela House, which is for women just getting out of prison and jail. Um, and I am the psychotherapist who works with the women there. I also work with um, and teach um, in the Harris County Jail for uh, the reentry program for women in the jail. My name's Mary Beth Archidiacono. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. My um, expertise is in grief and trauma. I am a fellow with the Child Trauma Academy and Dr. Bruce Perry. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with his work. I am also affiliated with Columbia University doing a um, curriculum project for grief curriculum and the Center for Complicated Grief with Dr. Kathy Shear. I do a lot of community integration work with people who have experienced traumatic loss. One of the things I forgot that's most important is um, I've been married for a gazillion years, and I have two grown daughters, and how I like to introduce myself is to say, my children are perfect, I have a perfect marriage, and I'm perfect. <laughs> let, me get, let me just balance that one out. I uh, have been married for 35 years. I was in a car accident 21 years ago. I lost my oldest son. I have a son with a brain injury. And because of the trauma we've experienced, I have a son who struggles with depression and a daughter who struggles with anxiety. I also lost my brother-in-law six years ago to suicide. So we have had it all, and another child with, who struggled with addiction. So our family is not perfect. <laughs> and I think um, part of our story is that we are very open about what we have lived through and gone through. And I think that's part of what's important uh, in this discussion today to spring light to those things. Well, I'm not going to cap any of that, but um, I, I am... I was kidding <laughs> about the perfect part. Right, we know you are. <laughs> uh, but I do believe that this topic, and I'm excited to be here and to have this discussion, especially being from the Indian community, um, this was the first year that... Um, a church in Houston had actually had me come out, um, and which led to a national conference. So our community um, is actually talking about this because it affects everyone. Um, so I think this is, as you can see, it personally affects many of us on this stage, but it affects lots of lives, and having the conversation is vital. So let's start off by talking about 
I think we all have kind of a basic grasp of what anxiety and depression are. But then how, what does that really look like? Because it's not the same for everybody, right? No, it's not. Yeah, so emotionally it's different. Physically, it, it affects you there. So kind of talk about what, what it is when you feels like in your body. I think for um, anxiety and depression, um, it's on a continuum um, that you could have very, you know, fleeting um, anxiety, and then you can have full-blown panic attacks. And they can go together, right? Yes. You don't have to have, they're not exclusive no, of each other. No, they're not. Um, and I think with depression, you could have the blues, and then you can have a major depressive episode where you can't get out of bed, um, you don't take a bath, you don't take a shower, you don't brush your teeth, um, you can't work, uh, you don't eat, you don't sleep, or you might eat too much or sleep too much. It, I mean, those are some of the physical um, symptoms that we would see. And so how do we know whether it's ourselves that are going through it or we're trying to help somebody else? I mean, we know when things are bad, bad. I mean, you know if someone's not leaving the house. I mean, we all get that. But before we get there, what are some things that we can look for even in ourselves or in somebody else? So I think um, a lot of times um, people talk about function, right? If we're able to go to school and doing what we're supposed to do, like with children, a lot of times one of the biggest indicator, what is their job? It's to go to school and do well in school. So if they're not doing that, um, there might be a problem. So how do you pay attention to um, noticing if their grades have slipped, if they're not wanting to go to school, if they don't get out of the house, um, their refusal? Um, I think for adults, there's a lot of functional adults, right? We might be drinking our pain away. Um, we might be masking our emotions um, by going and doing a lot of stuff, but really feeling empty inside. So I think it's really different for very different people. And well, I think isolation, when people start to isolate, whether it's a child or adult, too, when they take, when they, their support system is one of the most important things you have. And when they are not surrounding themselves with people, um, I think that's a big, you know, indicator of something. So talk about that isolation, because we've probably all seen people do that, even if it's a temporary depression, they're going through something tough and you notice they're not responding to your texts or repeatedly cancel lunch with you, those sorts of things. What is it about depression or severe anxiety that manifests itself in isolation that makes people want to kind of hole up themselves? I, I think for some it's just a lack of energy, um, emotional energy, physical energy. They just don't have what it takes. I know after my mom died that there were certain groups that I was a part of, and I really did pull away for a bit. I just didn't have the energy to kind of put on the face and do what you're supposed to do. And the other thing is I think with the social media and all of this stuff we have, everybody thinks everybody else's life is perfect. And I think, you know, that's one way of when you're looking at Instagram and Facebook and you see your friends, you think, wow. And then you, you go, oh, God, I can't go there because I'm miserable. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think we are in an age that is so much different than the age we grew up where there are so many things that contribute to us feeling worse about ourselves or being able to function in in the world today <laughs> and I think I think the Facebook page is at least for me I feel like it's like the old Christmas letters that people would mm -hmm. send out and say how perfect their lives were and then we compare ourselves and we can feel a sense of shame I had a client tell me years ago that any time that we compare our insides to somebody else's outsides, we lose. Comparison is the thief of joy. There's yeah. no question that quote is mm -hmm. correct. Wow. But I also think there's a lot of self-talk that we forget about that goes on in people's head. And that mm -hmm. is, you know, one of the things that does prevent, I think, some of these things. Yeah. And I think, you know, talking about what we say in our head and what we make up in our head is an important part of the conversation as well. Well, and I also think it's very hard to be vulnerable. I think people sharing that they're having a hard time is very difficult. Um, I know I'll have a lot of clients come in, in for individual counseling, but I've found I make lots of referrals to group therapy. And when they, they're they always reluctant, no one's saying, I want to go to group therapy. But what's interesting is when they go, they say, well, I'm not alone. There's other people that actually do and think and feel just like I do. And it's amazing to see how they feel just connected. Well, and, and talk about that we're not alone thing, because I do feel like that's one of the biggest problems 
with any of these issues is that people aren't talking. They're not sharing the reason that they're quiet that day at work. They're not sharing the reason uh, that they're upset or the reason they're canceling on the dinner party or whatever it is. They're not talking about their own issues. I have always encouraged my children, including my sons, to talk about their emotions and their vulnerability. I think there's a flip side to that, but... You know, when you're empathetic, it, it right. you know, you're not quite as happy as the rest of the people who can be superficial. But yeah. I think it's just important to encourage communication and being vulnerable. I think as women, we're easier. It's easier for us to be vulnerable. Um, I know with men, you know, I think about my husband. He's not always been, um, especially after we lost our son, it's harder for them to let their guard down. I just think we have to encourage open communication about our feelings and be able to process feelings you know, not just the good feelings, but the, the scary feelings. Well, and I think the idea of um, depression, um, I think one of the big myths about it is that that means then you are weak um, and people don't want to, especially men, but I think for everybody, don't want to own somehow that, oh, I feel this way, which then equates to weakness and we don't want to be seen as weak or vulnerable. And that's the hard part to um, break that silence and to be able to reach out to somebody and connect with them. Um, Because it isn't just about reaching out to a professional. I mean, we're talking about your friends, your coworkers, the people that you're on committees with. Um, Support groups of any kind. Well, Well, and it can be isolating, too, because your peers group are not going to get it. When my children had their experiences of their loss, especially even in college, they didn't have, you know, my daughter had a friend who was murdered her junior year of college, and it just triggered all of her loss. She was five when we had the accident. But there were not resources, and her friends, the worst thing they had gone through was a breakup with the boy or something. So I think colleges and universities especially are becoming more aware of the mental health issues, and they're trying to change, you know, because when you go away to college, that's a whole other peer group to worry about. They lose their support at home, and I know for my children that was an issue. I think I rambled, but no, sorry. That, no, <laughs> that's what this is, right? <laughs> well, and I, I think it's very important to be able to, you know, I went to a, um, a, a class yesterday at my kid's school um, in Fort Bend. They're trying to talk lots more about mental health and reaching parents. Well, they've been talking, they've had a something called an emotional backpack, and they're talking to kids about it. Oh. So again, if parents and schools and, um, you know, the community is, promoting that kind of talk. Mm -hmm. I came home and said, hey, what'd you talk about? You know, your counselor talked about this topic. Um, What do you think about it? And for them to just share what what they feel or what they think or do you notice? And the counselor said, you know, what I'm teaching the kids is if you notice that Julie was, you know, happy for three days and now she's sad, ask her, right? So even in kindergarten, like they're talking about those things. So having that communication and lines of communication because I think a lots of people know we're in a mental health crisis. Um, lots of people are suffering. Right. And so, as you said, I mean, we all know that it's better now as far as awareness. I think more and more people are talking about it. But yet we still have this stigma in, in the world. So even though we're all good, like we can all talk about it and talk about our own experiences openly, I think most of us would have a hard time sharing at work or sharing, you know, the real thing that's going on. Well, I... I don't know that I would advocate for people to necessarily bring it up at work. I think there would be other places that they would feel um, a better connection um, and it would feel safer um, because I think you have to have that sense of um, trust with someone to be able to open up and say what's going on and hopefully receive some empathy in return um, and compassion. And I think I was thinking more about the more that we normalize Mm -hmm. what's happening, you know, it's not this top secret Mm -hmm. thing anymore. I mean, I think about um, experiences I've had, like for example, when I was pregnant, I was rough, depression, anxiety. And when I was going through it, I kind of kept it to myself. But then when I started noticing my pregnant coworkers, Mm. then I was like, you know what? I need to start opening up about this. And sure enough, about half of them were going through the same thing. Yeah. And just knowing that someone else had been through it and could talk to them about it Normal was really episode. helpful. And again, we were work friends. We're not mm-hmm. personal friends. Mm-hmm. But I, so that's why I think I was thinking of it okay. is in, that, in that sense of making it not so stigmatized. Mm-hmm. But I see your point, too. There's that fear of, do I get labeled you know, yes. by my boss? Mm-hmm. Well, but also there are situations, and I know of a few, where you will have a colleague who has, is suffering from depression yeah. or and 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 
you know something is not right. And mm -hmm. I know my husband particularly had a situation where one of his colleagues back, I mean, everybody knew something was wrong yeah. with him. Everybody was trying to reach out. And he ended up, he did end up taking his life. Um, so I think there are situations where, you know, you there are flat red flags yeah. in an office environment where that is your family yeah. to some degree. That mm -hmm. was, and so what do you do in those situations? Because it does happen. Well, and what's very interesting in the last, I would say, year, we've had more people reach out to us to come talk to their companies, yeah. you know, from veterinarian animal hospitals oh, okay. um, with people that are suffering and the employers are saying, we got to talk about this, right? It's affecting um, them as humans, um, and we're getting calls. We don't know what to do with our client and our employees that are having suicidal ideations. So talking in companies, talking at schools, giving trainings um, is very eye-opening. I know when I lost my father two years ago, um, we have a very, I love where I work, um, and I feel like it's a family. We're essentially at work more than we sometimes are at home. And I remember going to work and saying to one of my colleagues, I can't, I don't get it. I can't get on top of my work. I, you know, I feel like the day is running and I can't get a balance. What's wrong with me? Am I ADD? And she said, Angela, you're grieving. Yeah. I mean, I'm a clinician. And I said, oh, like light bulb went on in me and we're in it. We're in the field. Mm -hmm. And I was totally unaware. But I had a friend that noticed and knew me to be able to say, by the way, what's what's going on, right? right? To And follow up right. with that. And I, I think that's one of the myths, too, that if you do see someone who's struggling and you talk to them or you say, you know, if they're talking about a pretty severe depression um, and then you ask the question, are you having any thoughts about right. not living, that we're not going to plant a thought in their head. And I think a lot of people are afraid to bring that up mm -hmm. because then they're going, oh, if they didn't have that thought, now they do. Um, and that's not how it works. So what is the right thing to do? I mean, let's say you've got someone at work that you know isn't feeling well and you've noticed a change in them and maybe it hasn't gone so far that they've said that they've had suicidal thoughts. Is there anything that you can or should do? Absolutely. I think it's with gentleness, right? It's showing that you care. Um, it, you know, all it takes is one person to know that you care or you're thought of and being able to reach out and say, hey, I notice." You know, something's different. Is everything okay? How are you doing, right? Um, just being able to check in with somebody is really, really uh, important. Is it your responsibility then to get them help, any of those sorts of things, or is it simply just being kind? I think you can make recommendations to somebody or ask, are they interested in getting help? And uh, you know, you can even share your own experiences and perhaps where you've gone. And if it's really severe, then in, we're at a work situation, I would go to a supervisor um, and let someone else know yeah. um, and not necessarily keep it a secret. Right. I think it's always important if you know to do take some kind of action. That doesn't mean you're responsible. When somebody dies by suicide, it's not anybody else's responsibility, right? Right. But I think anytime we notice, I, I mean, that's just me, but I think when we notice about any kind of human, just compassion and care that we should do, do something, mm -hmm. yeah. um, acknowledge it, or, you know, try to help, encourage them to get help or yeah. whatever. And again, I, I think we teach, like, we can't make anybody do anything, right? All we can do is encourage, support, um, and guide, right? If somebody's reaching out and offering, I think it is okay. I always say, somebody's having a heart attack in front right. of us, we're going to call 911. We're going to do some kind of action. So is there something asking them, can I, you know, I can drive you? Would you like referrals? Like being open to providing that information. But ultimately, it's people's decisions. Angel, you mentioned kind of special populations, veterinarians, for example, that I think have, you know, been in the news, you know, that this is some, a group of people that definitely don't take care of themselves in the same way maybe that others do. Are there other special populations that you guys deal with or that you know that you have this high rate of depression and anxiety and grief? Substance abuse. Substance abuse. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any particular group. I think, uh, I think you know, we talk about, like one of my colleagues says, when you go to these speaking things, you got to talk to men, right? Like okay. men don't seek help. Um, and a lot of times, um, one of the things that we do uniquely is if an individual comes to services with us, we tell them from the get-go, we want your entire system. 
We want your significant other. We want your children. We want to help the whole system because I can help you. And you're going to go ultimately back to that system. Yeah. So how do we help? And what's interesting is um, a child will say, well, my sister tried to commit suicide. And that affected me or attempted, right? Right. Um, or I lost a parent, or my dad is drinking and I'm affected. So it affects lots of other people. So having a conversation with the entire system is important. Um, I also think, again, lots of you know professionals, we think, hey, you got a doctor's degree or a law degree, you, you don't have problems. Well, we all have it, doesn't matter. And I think there's a, probably a common theme with uh, providers that help, like firefighters, police officers, nurses. Um, again, I think we are giving so much, a lot of times we forget about taking care of ourselves. I think also when you were talking about um, d being able to talk to men, uh, being able to recognize um, how s symptoms of depression can be different for women, I mean even among women, but also different from men. Um, and that I think one of the main ones that you might see is um, more of an agitated depression where everything makes them angry. Um, and that doesn't mean women can't feel that, but I think that feels safer for most people to be angry rather than to say, I'm hurting. So let's talk a little bit about uh, women and children, because I know that's one of the topics that we wanted to focus on today. Do you guys have any research that you guys want to share with people? You don't have to. I have. Um, I just thought I'd ask that since, you know, I like, I'm a big fan of research. So um, <laughs> some of this is just some of the statistics. Yeah. Um, there were more than twice as many suicides as homicides in the U.S., um, and this is as recent as 2017. Suicide was the 10th leading cause of death in the nation. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for those ages 10 to 14, and it spikes more around age 15. Um, not say that say that again. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for the ages of ten to twenty four. Wow. Um, and yeah, it is. And I mean, so we have to talk about it. We have to recognize it. I can remember being on a board um, where my children were in preschool, and we were going to do a presentation on children and depression. And one of the women in the room said, "Well, what do kids have to be depressed about?" And I was like, a lot? Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you... Children as young as four and five can be, have suicide ideation. Sure. I mean, they, it happens. At the school where my kids went, a, a child in sixth grade um, died by suicide when my son was in fifth and seventh grade. So it, it happens. People don't recognize that. Well, you have to remember, children are dealing with you know, just like we are, get stressed about what's happening in our communities or societies, children have impacts, right? It matters, it affects them. Um, I remember um, my second year, uh, second son, I was going to have a major surgery and I had went to the hospital a year before that, had his baby sister and I, as, as a therapist, I said, oh, I'm gonna go talk to him and remind him, hey, mommy's going to the hospital, daddy's gonna take care of you, grandma's gonna be here, I'll be gone for a few days, I'll be fine. And I remember sitting down with him, having this conversation, and he said, how about if you die? And I said, uh, I mean, I was shocked. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He goes, remember great grandma went to the hospital the same year I had my, his baby sister. Our, my grandmother passed away two months afterwards. Well, that's the last image he had. Mm -hmm. So again, they're affected. And being in tune with, you know, having that conversation and that dialogue and saying, they're affected and things matter. Um, I had another, um, one of my other children went um, to school this last year, and after Santa Fe shooting, there was a lot of differences in the schools, right? There's um, glass everywhere. You got to ring a bell. They're talking about putting um, something on the door yeah. um, so they can't get in. So there's intruder drills. I didn't have intruder drills. My kid came home three days later and said, I don't want to go to school. Right. What? Why? And he said, well, ha what happens if something happens at school? How are you guys going to get to me? How am I going to get to my baby brother and sister? So again, they're anxious, they're affected, they're triggered. And so being able to have that conversation, I think, is really important. And we think, you know, they have the language. They don't have the language. They don't know the skills of coping. It's our responsibility to teach that to them. I think another statistic is that childhood loss of a parent, particularly a mother, since you were talking about that, before the age of 25, I think it's a three to five fold increase for suicide. 
So there are, th and I think that brings to another point is that trauma, I think we forget that trauma um, is often overlooked, I think, when we're treating anxiety and depression. It can be an early childhood trauma that has never really been resolved or dealt with, and I think it's often overlooked um, that there are traumatic experiences in childhood that have been unaddressed that contribute to things. I think sometimes we forget about trauma. I know the population I work with at Angela House, uh, the statistics say one thing as far as the rate of trauma. I haven't met a woman who has been there who has not experienced more complex trauma of physical sexual abuse, parents dying, parents, you know, who have abandoned them. Um, and those issues get covered up with drugs and alcohol, which then, once you're into that whole pattern, that leads, leads, leaves you open to more trauma. So I, I, I absolutely agree with you as far as trauma. And, and it doesn't just have to be for women in prison or jail. I mean, you know, the average person experiences some type of trauma, um, whether it's witnessing it or hearing about it. Because when you were talking, I went back to when my daughter, um, my two daughters, they were in seventh grade, sixth grade, and no, seventh and third grade. Um, and they happened to watch, the TV was on at school when 9-11 occurred. Um, and for me, that was the first time I thought about, I'm buying my kids a cell phone because I wasn't going to do it before then because I want to be able to reach them if something were to happen. You know? And so talk about addressing those traumas before we get to a problem because I can imagine that you've got a kid who's gone through a trauma, but they seem fine. They're fine today, but then if you look at your study and the data, this loss could happen early on in life, but maybe it doesn't even manifest itself in a problem until they're in their 20s. So what can we do as parents, as school counselors, as anybody in a child's life? Talk, talk, talk. I mean, and be able to bring it up. Um, that, and to, I, I think, sit down and explain, you know, what loss is, um, what trauma can be, how it can show up, um, that we don't always see it that way, you know. Well, I think there are also ways, it's not just, it's, it's talking for sure, and it's about relationships. I mean, I think people, Bruce Perry always says people, not programs, are what help. Um, having that community support is very important, but there are also ways that trauma you have, you store it in your body. So I have been doing a lot of work right now on mind-body integration. There's a woman in Houston who does amazing work with helping you when trauma is stuck in your body. So it's, and also there are ways that you can help um, the things that are regulating, like my kids did sports. Anything you can do to help uh, somebody who has experienced trauma or even depression, anxiety, exercise, mm -hmm. things like that, that we have to sort of take the whole mind-body experience and, and yeah. it can't just be talk. You have to do mm -hmm. things that can help regulate children who can, you know, things that help soothing, diff different things like that. Yeah, lots um, of grounding techniques yeah. and those come in all It has to really forms. be holistic, I think, yeah. to yeah. really... I totally you know. And I think with children, like they don't have the language. So a lot of times I might get on the floor, right? They they don't want to talk to this complete stranger. So getting on the floor and playing, even if it's Jenga, right? And what you'll notice is they get so distracted with the game, they might start talking about, well, my dad did this, or I miss grandma, um, or my dog died, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're able to get distracted with an activity. Um, there's art therapy, right? right? Play um, therapy, all of those. Play things. therapy. So there's a lot of ways to, again, but it's how do we connect with them and get them to express themselves? So we've talked a little bit about some of the kind of risk factors for having a depression uh, or anxiety, uh, having suicidal thoughts. What about the person who doesn't have trauma, but is more um, of a genetic issue, an imbalance of some sort? So nothing's happened to them, but it's due to something internal. Can we talk about that? Sure. I, I think um, when, when reading through this again, that one of the populations that is at higher risk for suicide is bipolar disorder. Um, and that's um, you know, has to do with chemicals. Um, although I think there's treatment regarding medication 
There also has to be treatment regarding uh, whether it's DBT, um, What's DBT? Um, dialectical behavior therapy, which is learning how to recognize and, and regulate emotions, um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, when you were talking earlier about the thoughts that we have, that we can really enforce those, um, you know, negative thinking or beliefs that have nothing to do with, you know, what just happened, um, that we see it a particular way through our lens. You know. Again, I think a lot of times it's acceptance, right? If we do have a mental health issue, if it's mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever it is, it's mm -hmm. understanding it, getting knowledge, getting ed educated, um, and accepting that, okay, this is what's going on with me, just like if we had heart disease, right. just like if we had cancer. We need to understand it, understand how it affects us, find the right treatments, if it's medication, it might be changes in our lifestyle, right? right? Mm -hmm. It might be choices in what kind of jobs that we might be put ourselves in. Um, so I think it's a kind of a whole holistic approach, like, mm -hmm. um, and getting support if that's through spiritual means, if that's through family and friends. Um, who's your support group? Um, I think that's very important. Well, and I think if you're a parent and you have a child with the issue, you are going to have to be their advocate. I think mm -hmm. sometimes <laughs> we the systems aren't always in place to have the support that a child needs. And, and sometimes you have to be, I mean, I have a son with a brain injury and I can't even tell you the kind of conversations I've had to have. Or even when I'm dealing with a family with traumatic loss and they're, you know, even like at a, a school, an academically rigorous school, I've had to go into school systems and say, listen, they are not going to be able to do this work. They cannot do this work because they're grieving. And mm -hmm. grieving has a whole diff set of symptoms that people don't always recognize, but... Mm -hmm you don't function like you did before. So I think as a parent, it's, unfortunately, it ends up being, you know, something that we have to do and, and just find the resources to put in place for children because they are not always there. Yeah. And especially in underserved populations where, you know, school systems don't have counselors, I think that is always where my heart is, that we have to do better in underserved communities. Well, and I think for parents to do their job, I think if they've been affected in our families with losses, is how do you take care of yourself? How does that parent first recognize their, you know, you know, if their child has um, a diagnosis or disorder, how they have to either understand it, grieve it, have share their feelings about it, and then they'll be able to move into action of advocating for their child or um, figuring out support systems. Well, right, not every parent can advocate for their child, but I'm talking to the ones who are able to because. Yeah. I also think um, when we're looking at anxiety and depression, um, that recognizing what our limits are and not striving for the perfection that we seem to think is out there somewhere, um, I, Again, that sets us up for lots of feelings of anxiety. Oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. And I know for myself, I'm, I could be one of, I am at times one of those tightly wound type A people. And then I watch my daughters and them dealing with their anxiety. And I'm going, woo, I didn't set very good boundaries or set a good example of how do I take better care of myself, like you were saying, um, and to set some limits and to not think that I have to be able to do everything. Right. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, I think that was probably the one, the greatest gifts I learned was when you are struggling a little bit, cut yourself some slack. Mm -hmm. Don't set yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is not the time when you're grieving, when you've gone through a trauma, you're having a rough time of it. Now's not the time to put all those things on your plate. Well, read Kristen Neff's Self-Compassion, books about self-compassion. She's at UT. She is, and then obviously, when we talk about authenticity and, yeah. and vulnerability, Brene, Brene Brown. Brown. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and, and I think for me, I've extended that, like you were saying, you know, I've got a daughter and, mm -hmm. and I'm real honest with her that, listen, I'm not always perfect and I'm going to apologize to you a lot. I'm not always going to, you know, keep things in check. But then I've also empowered her to say, hey, you're being cranky. You're not being nice. You raised your voice to me, you know, so that it's not her responsibility, but at the same time, having an active role in understanding that I'm not perfect. I am going to get it wrong. I remember having the discussion with my oldest daughter, Rachel, at one point. She was about 16, and, you know, we're arguing about something because I really thought she was going to be an attorney. She could argue about <laughs> anything and everything and do it really well and have me doubting myself. Um, I was like, oh, <laughs> maybe. But I remember saying, you know, 
I get. And she said, Mom, I'm 16. I haven't ever been 16, and I'm struggling. with." And I said, I get that, and I'm a mom of a 16-year-old, and I've never been a mom of a 16-year-old before, so I'm going to struggle too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's super important. Well, and it's, it reminds me, my, you know, we teach our kids that, you know, we all make mistakes, right? How do you own it? How do you take accountability? How do you say, I'm sorry, right? Um, my daughter will tell me when I've hurt her feelings, right? Yes. She'll say, Mom, you need to apologize. Right. And she's right, yes. right? And so, again, how do we equalize ourselves with them so that they understand, yeah. hey, we're not perfect either, and it's okay if you make mistakes, and we're, things are fluid. We're going to learn together. And I think when, it, when you talk about depression and anxiety, I think the system, I mean, needing to have everybody on board is really important because the language, even you know, the, both parents, are, because easily can be dismissed and minimized um, and say the wrong thing to children who are really anxious or mm -hmm. depressed. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, get over it, or right. you shouldn't be feeling this, or don't be so anxious, or whatever. I think it's sometimes... It's all in your head. Yeah, all of the... What do you got to be sad about? I think learning yeah. the language as parents who have child struggling, and, and even to educate the people around them is important. How do we do that outside of this room? Because I'm getting the sense that most of us, while we aren't perfect, we're not going to always get it right, we're aware enough to know to try to not say those things to kids it's who are struggling. education and awareness, and that's what we have to do a better job of. We have to start early letting children know the language of feelings, and, you know, we teach them... if teaching they have a, them the language well, yeah, of feelings. Well, yeah, if you yeah. have a stomach ache, teach the language, but, you know, if you have a stomach yeah. ache, you know what to say, but right. if you're sad or anxious or scared, they don't always know, and I think and, it's just... And, and back to what you were saying about the body, I think a lot of times our body is the first place where we're recognizing feelings and aren't able to say what a feeling might be. So right. a child could come to you and say, oh, I have a stomach ache, right. and they could have the flu, or they could be really scared about something that's going on at school and their stomach is hurting. Um, and so we have to help them differentiate. And identify what yeah. it is. Right. Yeah. But it's paying attention to that, right? right? And a lot of times we have parents that take their children to the doctor, and the doctors will do a workup and say there's okay. nothing physically going on. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to go talk to a counselor. Maybe there's something emotionally going on. So I really definitely think it's kind of a collaboration, and mm -hmm. but it's having that conversation and teaching them. I think there's this movement right now, being kind, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Being able to teach kindness. So again, teaching parents to say the right things. I think if you really just think about it, if we could just teach children and adults um, to just be kind to one another. And I think that's a I, good start. I think uh, one of the things in talking about like trauma-informed care, uh, instead of walking up to somebody and saying, what's wrong? And so they immediately feel like something's wrong with them or they're not okay. It's like, so what's going on? Yeah. I mean, it's just a little bit of a shift. Right. You well, know? and Bruce Perry always says, with anybody, it's not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you, too, a lot mm -hmm. of times. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about trauma. Mm -hmm. So what have we not talked about that you guys feel like we need to share before we take some questions from the audience? Is there something we glossed over that you're like, we didn't dive deep enough into that? Or... I really um, wish I could have said this. I think it's, again, like, how do you have these conversations? Um, being here today, there's probably lots of thought-provoking things that come to mind. How do you go have conversations with your girlfriend or your significant other or your children and say, I heard this. Tell me what you're thinking. What are your thoughts about that? Just opening up the dialogue, I think, is important. Every time I go to a speaking engagement, I tell the audience, just go home and talk about this. Just reach out to a friend and say, hey, I heard this. What, what are your thoughts about that? It would be very, it's very interesting how that creates more awareness, education, and people researching, which I think is great. Bless you. Teresa, do you have anything that you wish we had talked about today? No, um, not anything in particular. I, I just think there's so much more. Yeah. Um, you know, because I'm sitting here looking at my sheet about warning signs and, you know, um, again, back to the idea of kind of this whole um, stress and anxiety and piling up and needing to set limits, um, whereas a lot of us then can turn to some type of substance or a glass of wine at 5 o'clock or, you know, whatever it might be to handle it. But when those things pile up, um, exorbitantly high, and then we are drinking way too much, so that exacerbates um, 
all the symptoms that we're going to experience and I think needing to be aware of that because again, I think that the drinking or whatever else the substance might be is an attempted solution to kind of deal with something in here just as suicide is an attempted solution or the thoughts about it to decrease pain. I think I'm going to read from Reasons to Stay Alive this last paragraph and then um, it says, how will we better contain depression? Expect no magic pill. One lesson learned from treating chronic pain is that it's tough to override responses that are hardwired in the body and mind. Instead, we must follow the economy of mood where it leads, attending to the sources that bring so many into low mood states. Think routines that feature too much work and too little sleep. We need broader mood literacy and an awareness of tools that interrupt low mood states before they morph into longer and more severe ones. These tools include altering how we think, the events around us, our relationships, and conditions in our bodies. That means exercise, medication, or diet. So. so we didn't talk a ton about what it looks like when you do go get help. It's different for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. it, can you give us kind of an idea of the expectations? Maybe you, know, you decide you're, you're going to reach out to somebody. What does that actually look like? Is there anybody in here who hasn't been to therapy or isn't a therapist? Every, a couple people. So yeah, still a valuable question then, I think. So you, you just find one? Like, you find a therapist? Well, and usually, I, I would think you would ask friends. Sure. Um, or ask your doctor, mm -hmm. you know, who do you recommend? Yeah. Um, who would you go to? Um, and then if you happen to have insurance, that may limit who you go to also. Right, with all um, the So, yeah. Um, and there are a lot of different agencies around um, because then money can be a factor, um, I know years ago in my start, I worked at Family Service Center, and that was on a sliding fee scale. Um, so, I mean, they're just different places to be able to help people um, all over the city, although I don't think um, for people with less income that we have much to offer. Um, I think we need a lot of growth in that area. Um, I think, again, if we know that something's wrong, you know, I have a lot of people say, I'm knocking on the door when something, there's a crisis. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing now more people calling, parents calling, saying my teenager said I need to set up an appointment for her, which is amazing. That is not what happened, I would say, 20 years ago when I got into this business. So again, listening to um, our kids being preventative. Um, I do a lot of premarital counseling. Um, before you get married, before you have transitions, before you go off to college. Again, having a relationship with somebody that could be uh, unbiased, that could lead and guide, I think is a part of counseling. But also, when you're in, in therapy, it's figuring out, it could be the diagnosis, but what's the goal? What's gonna make your life feel happier, healthier, feeling more successful? How do you make those changes? It might be that you have to do trauma work. Maybe you need medication, um, but it's have, having, a, I think, a trusted um, relationship with somebody that you've built a, a rapport with, I think is important. Should we take some questions from the audience? Do you wanna use my mic? Okay. I'm good at that. Hello, thank you all for being here. The, the most serious depression I ever experienced was my husband was transferred to London, and I had one teenager in Houston, one teenager in London, and then my father was slowly dying in another state, and I was commuting for a year of this. And I got so extremely depressed, but I thought it was psychological. And then I had a full nutrition evaluation and come to find out that I was severely deficient in vitamin D3 and all my stress vitamins, B vitamins had burned up. And I had tailored nutritional supplements for the nutritional deficiencies and I got better. So I just wonder how, and, and I have a really healthy diet, so I never suspect I have a PhD in nutrition. So you would think I would know this, but I just didn't realize how much stress and the fact that uh, D3 is so necessary and living in London where the sun 
wasn't, or where we are here with so much sunscreen that we're affected nutritionally and it causes depression. So if you could speak to that. Well, I know statistically, and people don't realize, there are, I forget, maybe 40% of the people don't absorb D and B properly, and that is something to consider. Um, I'm one of them. And so I've been on megadoses before of vitamin C. So I think it's important. Well, also thyroid issues thyroid. can mimic depression. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 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 so there I are think definitely it, physical. Yeah, I, I learned a long time ago um, when my I was in graduate school thinking I knew it all um, and hearing different things. Um, and my sister had just started at Texas Tech. And she was talking about kind of this tingling sensation in her face or feeling like it was going numb. And I asked the ridiculous question, you know, like, so what else maybe aren't you wanting to feel? And 15 years later, it came out that she, those were the beginning symptoms of MS for her. So I never am, am going to jump to a conclusion without, you know, suggesting to somebody that they do get a workup. Um, because I don't, I, I think there are lots of things we can miss. Well, and mood can be affected by what we eat. I think it's important to consider nutrition always in the scheme of it. Yeah, I think collaborating with a medical professional and getting a workup, mm -hmm. um, making sure your labs look okay um, and there's nothing medically or physically going on is important. I, he's, he was next, right there. What, I, sorry, I'm going out, but I saw this man. Oh, yep, there you go. <laughs> I don't want to leave these men out. When they're <laughs> well, there's not many of us here today. <laughs> I but, always um, like when they speak up, so speak but, up. Yeah, very interesting subject. I, I wanted to see if y'all could address the medications from, you know, we see Wellbutrin to Prozac. How effective are these drugs? Or is that a legitimate therapy? Or because we see, I see effects of that, but not necessarily cures for that and so can you address that first? i'll jump in first i think i first of all i don't think there is anybody should feel shame for taking a medication but they i think you it's also another thing that has to be everybody responds differently to different medications so there is not one size fits all and i think that's the first way you have to approach it if if, if somebody is suggesting that you need medication i think it's important to try but they don't always work um and there are other ways that you can get by without medication, but I think it's important to at least try that if someone's suggesting that. And, and again, sometimes it, it, it could, you could go through five or six different trials to find something that might work. I'm remembering from a um, presentation years ago by Bessel van der Kolk, who is a trauma specialist. Um, Body Keeps Score, that's yeah, his book. Yeah, um, and he was talking about as far as, I mean, at the time talking about how effective certain antidepressants are. And the percentage it can actually be pretty low, um, for, but if they're working for you, they can be uh, you know, pretty wonderful. I mean, not that it's a happy pill, um, but can help um, balance things for you. But that there are other ways um, to intervene, whether it's diet, whether it's a workup, um, whether it's EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing that therapists use for trauma, um, body work for trauma. And Gabor Mate, if you know any of his work, he's very fascinating with trauma and the body and different ways mm. to work some of these mental health issues to integrate them, do body work to help. Well, and I think part of it is I, we work with a lot of psychiatrists, um, and one of their philosophies is um, it's in conjunction with therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there is no magic pill. Taking a pill is not going to solve everything. It might give you um, what you need to be able to regulate yourself so you can do the work, so you can figure out the trauma or figure out how to cope or figure out how to manage yourself. So but I think it's in... Then you also have to be able to talk and learn how do you set limits how do you say no? How do you have boundaries? Yeah. All of that. So for a patient, though, how do you navigate the sheer number of medications that are out there? Because I feel like that's part of it, right? And then they're telling you it may not work. You have to wait 
a month so to see if it works. Well, that's why you really, I think you have to find a good psychiatrist yeah. or somebody who really knows what they're doing because there are a lot of people out there who do not Just really know. They, they will. And, and I think it has to be trial and error. But I can tell you, I, was, I am a whole foods organic. I've done that since, um, you know, forever. You know that. Um, and I was not going to take medication after my accident. I was like, I'm not. And I could not have functioned without it. They finally put me on a tricyclic antidepressant. And, I could, you know, I was on it for a year and a half. But, you know, he, this doctor, he was a really good psychiatrist. And he sort of knew. But, again, I've also been on ones that haven't worked. Um, well, and having a conversation, I'll send people who are resistant to medication and say, go have a conversation with a psychiatrist, get knowledgeable. Maybe you won't ever do it, but maybe you will, right? But again, exposing yourself to having conversations about my fears or what are the side effects. And hopefully the psychiatrist, if you're working with one that's good, that will be open. Tell me if you're having side effects. Don't wait a month till your next appointment. Call me, reach out, let's see each other in two weeks. So there's always um, ways to figure out if that's the right match. And there also is a lot of good research right now on exercise in the brain and, yeah. and depression and anxiety. So yeah. I think there are, you know, other ways, ways other than just that, that you can... Right. No, 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 I get that. I, I'm, I don't even mean the gym. I mean just getting walk out around the walk, walk around your the block. Your neighborhood. Yeah. You know? it, what you just said, there's um, a, a man, a, actually a psychiatrist at um, Menninger's. His name is John Allen. And years ago, um, he wrote an article called The J Word, which is, it's just depression. Um, and that um, what he says is, all the things you must do to recover from depression are made difficult by the symptoms of depression. So don't isolate, but you don't feel like going out. Stick to a schedule, but you don't feel like doing anything. And people are like, you know, just put your big girl panties on and do whatever it is you're supposed to do. And you're like, I don't feel like putting my big girl panties on. I yeah, can't. I can't. Um, and, but it's having to work with that um, slowly. Um, and and it, it doesn't just disappear overnight. We're still, we still don't know how to deal with these things. I work with the Voices of September 11th, and a lot of the children who were young when 9-11 happened are in their 30s now, and these children are still, they, some of them can't hold jobs. Mm -hmm. they, we still don't know what to do, and I think uh, there's nothing wrong with saying we still don't know what we're doing, but mm -hmm. I think we have to do a better job, and we're still trying to figure this out. But I think it's you know, through a combination of different Looking holistic. So I'm not okay. sure. Did we answer your question? Probably not. We... <laughs> Do you okay. have anything else you want to follow up with after we did or didn't answer what you asked? <laughs> well, I mean, chemical therapy, it seems like everyone seems to be getting better. Yeah. Uh, I want to throw a drug in there. Yeah. I want to throw this, I throw that, I throw that. That goes on for years. Listen, if you go look at the foster care system and you see yes. the number of psychotropic medications... Five-year-olds are being put on, and you yep. get more money if you have a child on medication. And then we wonder, I mean, I think still even ADD and ADHD, when we're putting children mm -hmm. on these drugs and then they have addiction issues later, we, we're still not figuring those things out well either. I mean, there are times when it's warranted, but again, you know, we're doing the same thing with children, throwing drugs at them um, in, certain, in certain systems, especially in the foster care system. Yeah. No, I don't. No, I've been to be quiet. I'm... I'm start. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm a physical therapist, and I specialize in patients with brain injury and spinal cord injury. Um, and that patient and their families are very susceptible to depression, anxiety, due to the trauma of either the accident or the stroke or anything that happened. Um, do you all have any tips or advice on preventing, it's not so much preventing, but since they are more susceptible, any things that I can tell them to seek to do or, you know, different tips for them to maybe try to avoid getting too far into depression or anxiety after such You're trauma? talking about the caregivers or the fam family of somebody with a brain injury? Both either the patient or the caregivers. Well, I've lived that myself, so I can tell you um, from my own experience my son who had the brain injury, he was 11 when he had it, and 
there was a, he, he didn't know that my son, other son died because he came out of his coma three months later. So we had to tell him and he went through a really tough period of depression. So they put him on Prozac. Um, and it was interesting. I was also doing all these supplements. We had found a doctor in the East Coast who was analyzing his blood and the fatty acids. So we were giving him all of these nutritional supplements. And he, has, the child has never wet his pants and he went and spent the night at somebody's house and he, he wet the bed. And he was like in sixth grade. Um, the medication was making him sleep so soundly, but he, he later said to me, Mom, I don't like the way that green pill makes me feel. So it was not helping him. The medication made it worse. Um, I think there is a lot of grief with a brain injury or, or a stroke because you're, you've lost something. And, and my sons didn't go through it. We were going through it because we were watching. We noticed, I mean, this is my son who was, you know, top of the class, just won the athletic award, and he couldn't even talk. Um, I think it's important to, to acknowledge the grief and the loss because it is, and, and that's not always an easy conversation. And I think um, with the patient, it's, it's harder, too, because you don't know. It's hard to understand what's going on when it's a brain injury or something like that. What's causing, there could be an imbalance. Um, I'm not really answering, but I think it's just a lot of communication and talking about the loss. Yeah. I mean, I think having to recognize, you have to recognize yeah. that. I mean, I still, yeah. you know, he's 33, and I still have times where, you know, it's there are things that I know are happening because of his brain injury that would not have. Um, I think, like, a lot of conversation we talked about prevention and awareness, right? Um, I know like at nursing homes um, and, and palliative cares and cancer hospitals, they have groups, grief groups, right? Being able to provide um, a group maybe at your facility or having information there. Um, if we can't, we don't, we don't know how to have that conversation sometimes with our patients or their families, I think it's being able to arm them with that kind of information might be a way to just get that conversation started in our um, in our waiting room. We have like a bookmark that Walt Menninger gave about emotional maturity. Um, I take that to schools, and parents will call because there's a number on it and say, uh, "I notice that I don't have this, or my kid doesn't have this," and it just starts conversation. So being able to create something with warning signs um, about self care, about grief and loss, and effects of that trauma. Um, might be good. Having books laying around in the waiting room or in common areas might just be a way to start that conversation. There are also internet support groups. I know some of the brain injury associations have some good websites, the Brain Injury Association of America. Um, I, we still don't do a good job with brain injury um, and, and support, but I think you know, trying to help access resources for family members is a good, you know, something. I know that there are online chat groups um, for survivors. And, and TIER, are you, what, who yes, are, you're with TIER, okay. So, I mean, they, my son was at TIER. Uh, so we, they have some, but it's still kind of shocking in the city how limited the resources are for TBI, stroke, all of that kind of thing. I know with stroke, older adult stroke patients, there are some support groups, kind of the aphasia society and some of those other groups, but it's still rough with brain injury. I think it's also, again, how do we bring that to our administration or our leaders at um, our organizations to be able to say, hey, this is, I notice this, what can we do? Um, how do we start having that conversation to provide direct care to our patients and families? Well, and you can start a support group. I have led so many groups, you know, just making them up because sometimes, you know, you start a family support group if they don't have one already. Um, it's amazing, like you've said before, about the benefit of sharing your experiences with others. So, you know, if the program isn't there, advocate to start one. Or if the group isn't there, start one. I have more warning signs um, regarding suicide, and I'll be glad to share those. Talking about or wanting to die or to kill oneself, <laughs> looking for a way to kill oneself, um, talking about feeling hopeless or having no purpose, talking about feeling trapped or being in unbearable pain, talking about being a burden to others, and those um, three, the, the feeling hopeless and having no purpose, 
feeling trapped in unbearable pain and being a burden are some of the biggest red flag indicators um, when that somebody would be willing to do something to hurt themselves. Increasing the use of alcohol or drugs, acting anxious, agitated, or reckless, sleeping too little or too much, withdrawing or feeling isolated, um, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, and displaying extreme mood swings are all warning signs. And some of those also include some of the symptoms of depression, which again could be sleeping too much, sleeping too little, isolating, not eating enough, um, which I've never had that problem, or eating, you know, eating way too much. Um, so um, those are some of the smaller signs that you might see. Hygiene is often one of the first things to go um, for people who are feeling um, depressed, that it just takes too much effort. When, with with suicide, there are also passive ways. If you have somebody who's older where they're, you know, just drinking a lot or mm -hmm. high-risk behaviors where they might not be verbalizing that they want to die, but they're doing these things that are more passive. Well, I think substance abuse in and of itself can be a slow form of suicide you know, for some people because they don't have other ways to be able to express... Um, what they're feeling and what's going on and needing opportunities to be able to talk about what those feelings are. Well, I think a lot of times you have dual diagnosis. So I think look, take addiction on its face and then think about what that other diagnosis Components, might yeah. be. It could be depression, it could be bipolar, it could be anxiety. I think yeah. I would separate that out. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes people give away stuff. You might notice that they're, mm -hmm. you know, putting tags on things. Little kids might say, this is for Susie. This is giving away some things because they know they're not going to be around. Um, there might be a big shift from being very depressed and not doing everything, anything, to now I've made the decision and they're getting very engaged. They're calling and they haven't called in weeks. So those might be other subtle kind of um, and, or aggressive ways of noticing. Or people who are being bullied. I mean, that's another issue that I think is relevant for these kids this age. When well, somebody is being bullied to the point where they might consider doing that. And I think, again, it's really important as parents, um, knowing what's on your kids' devices, limiting those devices, how they're affected. Um, I tell parents, check your history. Put things on those devices. Our job as parents is uh, not to love them. We do that automatically. It's to protect them mm -hmm. and to prepare them for the world that they're going to enter, right? So I think we have to do that. I have, one more qu I have a question. I'm an OB here in Houston, and um, I feel like even in a big city like Houston, some of our patients have difficulty getting in with a therapist. I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I famously say, like, I wish we had drive through therapy. You get a water burger, get some therapy, we'd all be a lot nicer to each other in the world. And um, But I think that we, you know, ran our referral list recently, and a lot of the therapists had moved, or they were booked for months. And um, I think telemedicine is sort of making a wave, and I just didn't know if you had seen um, an improvement in your field um, that where you really feel like it's working well, where women or patients can get um, online appointments and talk, you know, through a different medium. So one of our biggest pillars or philosophies is if you're calling, I'm going to get you in. Um, so we have a rule at our practice within 24 to 72 hours, we're getting you an appointment. People aren't calling to wait a week or two weeks, right? So we really do believe in that. And one of our clinicians will find a way to get you seen, um, especially if there's a crisis going on. Um, but People, can't, people might not be able to afford our services, but I really believe in advocating, and so let me help you. You email me, I'll, I'll look at your entrance, I'll try to narrow some people down. Um, being a part of Menninger's, we're a nonprofit, so which I'm excited to be able to say that part of our um, you, part of the services that we have, pro if you fall and qualify for financial assistance, you can see me just like you would pay self care for free and come to groups and maybe even see a psychiatrist. Because again, we want to be able to, just like with everything else, have people get access to care. There's a group called the Nick Finnegan Counseling Center. If you, I was on their board, a friend of mine, this named after her son. Um, they have a sliding scale and they are, they have a lot of, I mean, it's not hard to get an appointment there. I think sometimes they're just resources we don't know about, but again, you're right. 
this is a big city. Um, there's lots of other, I think, little. Yeah, there's um, some other li little um, agencies that will do sliding scales. Um, people have copay. Um, uh, we always try to network and try to find people. So I think it's important to be able to know who good people are and send them. Well, and you also mentioned the, the idea of teletherapy, and that's kind of a growing um, business. Um, but I think with it comes lots of concerns about HIPAA. Um, and follow through, things like that. Um, I'm kind of old-fashioned in that way that I still want to meet face-to-face -face with somebody um, and not through a screen. Um, I just, but there are, there are lots of people who are practicing um, and using teletherapy. I think it can be effective. I think, again, check credentials. That's always, to me, the important thing. Yeah, and I think it's really important, especially if our clients... I usually do it with established clients um, who li might live far away mm -hmm. or are struggling. I'd rather them see me on a screen versus um, not come in for weeks. Um, so if we can, again, I think the whole thing is take away barriers. Well, um, right. If you have somebody who's depressed and doesn't want to leave their home, if you can do it over a uh, thing, it's better than no intervention at all. And I've worked with uh, kids who, when they were in high school and gone off to college and they're in another city, as you said, like they're already an established client that I would work with them and do FaceTime, something like that. Um, not so much a question, but just a comment and to echo what you're saying. Um, I didn't know that our employer offered six free counseling sessions without even having to be enrolled in my healthcare plan. And I actually learned that through another a coworker, um, but it's nice to start where you are, see what resources are available to you. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to find somebody. I got the, um, in, as soon as I called, I would ask, are you accepting new patients? Because that is a barrier to break. But um, again, I didn't even know that we had that resource at work. Um, and I think a lot of employers are gonna catch on and, and start providing that kind of resource. So just as another method of seeking help. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, employers have that employer assistance program um, in place. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice to, and it wasn't very expensive. I want to say it was like four hundred dollars without insurance because they would take our insurance for that. Um, but when you talked about when you had that question about that, I just that was mm -hmm. the first thing that came to mind because it allowed us to rule out so many things mm -hmm. and to figure out where to start. They've it gotten was, a lot better, improved that yeah. kind of technology. Yeah. It was very reliable. It's I not. It's not a perfect science, but it does actually help lots of people get on medicines faster, quicker, better, or adjust and totally get off medicines that don't. So, But again, it's cost prohibitive. Yeah. Like, I mean, $400 a lot of people could not do, right? So that's part of the problem. Right. Sure. It's in a good one. They take insurance, they just couldn't take off. Yeah. It's not a non-invest, I mean, it's. It, you put, get a swab in your mouth. Well, yeah. My son's done it. Which medications of the choices mm -hmm. of the process even? Mm -hmm. And metabolize. Are we talking about the same? Yes, it's yes. psychiatric medication. And, and her daughter did it. My son's done it too because he's. And I, I wish it was. My, Again, I wish it was for everything, right? Like, again, if we could get that knowledge. Uh, I think earlier. we will get to that point where that is part of a panel. No, but it, it's and it's an important one, and I'm glad you. Right. That was neutral, or that was one that isn't going to work. At least know where it falls for her genetically. Right. No, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot about that. That's great. Um, first of all, thank you for being here today. I'm so glad that there, there's these types of talks because I think there's still so much stigma around mental health and it's super important to have these conversations. Um, secondly, I just wanted to kind of talk about 
signs of depression and suicide that are not typical because I've lost a nephew to suicide and he was the popular kid. Everybody liked him. He was funny. He was happy. He would always talk to everybody. So when he died, everyone was very surprised by it because he wasn't exhibiting those signs of having depression or being sad or, you know, later looking at some things, there might have been like things where he would make sarcastic comments and stuff like that, but it's not like the typical, I want to die or I'm feeling hopeless type symptoms. I think sometimes there's like impulsivity, right? We can't cope with something or something feels really horrible. So um, that's just another kind of sign of that's not what they meant to do, but it's like accidental um, suicide or accidental overdose. Um, and they don't talk a lot about, um, like you were saying, drugs and alcohol, people taking, um, pills and it looks like you're, you have a drinking problem, but you're really trying to numb some kind of pain that's going on. Um, so those are other, other things to kind of look But I for. think that situation is one of the hardest to identify because, yeah. you know, you, you don't realize that. And, and, part of that mask might have been that personality, but that's a really hard one for somebody to figure out. I mean, that that is one of the most complicated types of suicide because looking back, what could you have done? What were the signs? And I think there are, I don't think that's super common, but it does happen. And I think, again, when you were talking about the impulsivity, that if, you know, he, the sarcasm might be there, but then when he makes the decision... You know, that boom, if he has access to something, makes it much more likely that someone may do something. Especially, uh, I mean, if people have firearms in the home, um, pills that are around. Um, Knives. Not, yeah. The that, accessibility to a, a firearm definitely increases the yeah. risk, no doubt. So, again, a big thing is prevent, uh, preventing those barriers, mm -hmm. put barriers in well, place. Well, and, and we are, they are trying to, Texas Gun Sense is trying to, work with the legislation to, to make some laws to support that. Yeah, well, right. Let's not get into politics. I'm going to throw me off the stage. I just uh, first want to thank you all and just your personal, uh, sharing your personal stories and being transparent is definitely helpful. Um, I know we talked a lot about our children, but I think a lot of us are at the age where we may, we may be caretakers for our parents. Mm -hmm. And so how easily is it to discriminate just the changes that come with the natural aging process, sleeping more, slowing down, not eating big meals versus signs of true depression? How, how easily is it to discriminate between those? Statistically, I forget how many women are in roles right now of caregivers. I, I'm in one myself. Um, and it is a really rough place to be. I think we don't acknowledge the role of being a caregiver. Um, and I think the transition part of, you know, when we go through our midlife or when we're postmenopausal and, you know, our children are gone and we're grown and then we're caring for our parents and then also having the stress of our own lives is a, a delicate mix um, I don't know that there's a whole lot out there, but I do know that there are some support groups for caregivers because um, it's becoming a huge burden on women, particularly in, in our country. Well, and I think there's, um, again, the role reversal, right? You're taking care of your parents, um, and they were the ones that are taking care of you. It's a lot of people have kind of like this, um, they're traumatized, right? Like seeing their parents being strong and independent and having it's the... It's hard to accept that. Hard but to it's accept, depressing too. Right, depressing to it's see very depressing. if they have terminal illness or, you know, they can't do what they want to do. And it's hard for the individual, right, to be able to, you know, hearing your parents say, God, I wish I wasn't here or, or uh, I hate this pain, um, I think, again, has effects on us. Um, and being able to get support is really important. And I think that is going to be, I think, the thing that's going to be coming because our, uh, we're going to have elderly parents um, and taking care of little ones. Well, and I, and think I also think in recognizing some of the signs, because I don't, I don't believe that depression is a natural part necessarily of getting older, but there may be statements about how much pain somebody is in, how lonely they might be, all of their friends have died, what's the point in going on, those type of statements that I think we need to be aware of with elderly parents. And, and also, some, back to what she was talking about, the D3, being aware of um, certain physical symptoms or physical issues that can cause some 
big symptoms such as my mom would have a UTI. Um, and that, that would, the first time I came across that, and she's talking about, I mean, just psychotic as could be and hallucinating mm -hmm. and seeing this and that. And it was the UTI because it took so much of her energy to deal with that infection that, you know, but once that was treated, she wasn't experiencing the hallucinations again. But are you talking more for yourself as the caregiver and the, the symptoms you're experiencing, right? Um, no, maybe for that. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not put it out there, but uh, just not knowing how far to push her, knowing, okay, she is 73 years old, she should be sleeping more, she should be eating as much, instead of just saying, hey, mama, you haven't ate, you know, three meals today. Now, my grandmother ate like a bird when she was a certain age. She really did. Yeah, and so just trying to not push too much, assuming this is depression, right? And realizing it's the age thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.